Okay, welcome, good morning. I'm very happy to welcome this high-level panel. Over the past month, uh, when I worked with the colleagues on this report and when I mentioned that to neighbors or to friends, I met the general perception that, oh, algorithms, this is for nerds. And this may indeed be the general perception. Call it nerds or call it highly specialized professionals. What this report shows, I think, is that this topic is something that can affect everybody and that should concern everybody in society. We're really happy for the big interest today and we're happy to have such an excellent uh, group of MEPs and panel here and later we have a panel of experts. Um, and we are very grateful to Julia Reda, Lisa Jakonsari, and Michael Boni to bring this important topic or to make space to bring this important topic into the parliament uh, where it should be discussed. This report is, I dare say, a genuinely European report. Uh, this is not just one person, however highly uh, level, high level and expert, uh, to write it up. It is a cooperation of experts from these 12 countries. Uh, the team was composed from north and south and east and west. And we, in the work, in the work process, we could help each other, we could inspire each other, we could shed light on uh, what may be of biases. So the collaborat collaborative effort as such made this into a European report. It was really enriching. Some of the contributors are here in the, uh, on the panel and later on the expert panel, and some of them are here in the room, I think. Um, the work of all of them is distilled into the report that is at the back. Now, uh, the idea behind the work of the report will be introduced to you by Ralf Müller Eiselt from the Bertelsmann Foundation. Uh, he's the director for the program of Megatrends. I love that title. And he focuses on several projects concerning algorithms and ethics. Ralf, please. Many thanks, Brigitte. So, um, also let me welcome you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, members of parliament, for getting this great opportunity to present this uh, report and to discuss this, discuss this report with you. Um, there's a fine line um, between promise and peril when it comes to using new technology. And um, I think it's up to us to decide whether um, algorithms and automated decision-making becomes a catalyst for strengthening um, social equality or for weakening it. And um, exactly this question is um, what made us work on this report in a joint collaborative um, effort. Um, it's up to us as a society um, that algorithms, automated decision-making systems um, are implemented with the right purpose um, in mind. And um, we, as a foundation, as the Bertelsmann Foundation, um, we decided two years ago to um, enter this new field for us, um, the new field of technology and technology policy. And what we, and why, why, why are we doing that? Um, so it's basically just um, transferring our main purpose as a foundation to the digital sphere. Um, we want to make a contribution to promote social inclusion for everyone. We did want this in analog times and we still and even more keep um, willing that in digital times. Um, with our um, initiative Ethics of Algorithms, um, we are committed to take a close look at the consequences of automated decision making. And um, as I already alluded to, our goal is uh, to contribute to ensuring that the system are used to serve society, not the other way around. Um, we basically want to do three things. First, we want to inform the public about what is going on um, in this new field. Um, secondly, we want to take um, part and contribute to developing solutions, how to deal with um, <coughs> algorithms and um, automated decision systems. And thirdly, probably most importantly, we 
want to um, help structuring the public and political discourse um, with regards um, to these systems. And this is what made us bring today to this um, great place um, to discuss the report. We are extremely proud and thankful to have this opportunity, um, as I said, and we are proud to be part of uh, this collaborative effort with the Open Society Foundation and Algorithm Watch. Um, the report shows how widely ADM systems are used in Europe, but it also shows how varied and inconsistent the effort to deal with this challenge are across Europe. And um, let me finish with one thought. Um, if there is one thing I really hope we can make a small contribution to with this report, um, it is to close the policy gap between member states of the European Union. So this is uh, my personal main takeaway. There is a huge policy gap. And we are convinced Europe needs to join forces and speak with one voice when it comes to setting standards for automated decision um, systems. So this is my, uh, my little wish and hope we can make a contribution to launching this report today here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. Uh, with a clear wish, that's always fine. Let me hand over to Matthias Spielkamp the executive director of Algorithm Watch in Germany. The name is a declaration, Algorithm Watching. Uh, in this case, we had an intense dis discussion on how to define automated decision making when we prepared this report so that all the contributors in this team in the collaborative effort were working in the same direction. And Matthias is the editor of the report, and he is the one who ensured this clear focus. Matthias. Thank you very much. And uh, also from my side, thank you very much, members of parliament. I'm especially delighted that the three of you are here, because we think this is a very uh, wide-spanning issue, so that we were able to make this a non-partisan uh, presentation here is, is uh, very important to me and, and to the collaborators. So um, I have 15 minutes to present you the results and how this report came about. So I'll uh, be quick. And if I'm too quick, please interrupt me or otherwise just use the report and read up on it afterwards. Um, I'll tell you a little about what Algorithm Watch is, but very briefly, then why did we do this report? The approach we took, the research network, because it's a very core uh, part of the entire effort. Um, I'll give you an overview of the results and some examples and then turn to the recommendations. And then I'll be very keen to hear what the members of parliament have to say about this because they'll comment on that afterwards. So uh, Algorithm Watch, we are a non-profit organization and we have the aim to evaluate and shed light on algorithmic decision-making processes that have, and that is really important, a relevance to society. You know, we're not looking at some uh, production lines that use artificial intelligence or something like that. Um, we are looking at processes that are either used to predict or prescribe human action or to assist or make decisions automatically. And that is a definition of automated decision making that is very contested and that we discussed a lot when we prepared this report and this is developing. So this is part of uh, why we are doing this. So what do we do? We have a mission statement and we say that we watch, of course, algorithm watch, meaning that we look at um, implementations of algorithmic decision making or automated decision making. We try to explain this to a general public, um, but also, of course, to policymakers, to civil society stakeholders and others. We network, meaning we try to be um, a uh, stakeholder ourselves who builds networks of collaboration, which is uh, a fantastic, or the report is a fantastic um, example of that. And we engage, and with engage we mean that we also um, uh, engage in this process of uh, finding answers and probably solutions to the challenges that we are facing as societies when it comes to automated decision making. Now, um, right now, because that is always an important question with uh, non-governmental organizations, where does the money come from? We are financed by grants from the Bertelsmann Stiftung from Hans Böckler Stiftung, which is also a German uh, foundation that is close to the unions in Germany, by Open Society Foundations. And uh, we uh, last year had a substantial amount of um, money from crowdfunding because we did a project that some of you might have heard about, Open Schufa, uh, trying to shed light on a opaque uh, 
uh, credit scoring um, system in Germany and uh, that we did, we funded with uh, crowd uh, cr crowdfunding money. Now, why this report? Why did we decide to do this? Because um, automated decision making is at the core of the debates that we are having about discrimination, equality and participation. And this is always this question of framing. What are we talking about? Are we talking about technology? No, in our opinion we are not talking about uh, technology. We are talking about very important political and societal issues that are in a sense influenced by technology and of course there is always an interdependence. Uh, we used to talk about uh, social technology technological systems. Many people don't do that anymore because it's a very cumbersome word or phrase to use, but it's a good idea to keep in mind that this is what we're talking about. We're not talking about um, um, a software program. We are talking about the systems that, uh, that are built with these and why they are built and what they are supposed to achieve. And the examples that we usually use to discuss this are mainly from the United States or more and more China. Um, for example, risk assessment of criminals, the death by algorithm um, in the health sector or social scoring. That's always on the top of our agenda and we felt that it's about time to uh, look at our own countries, the member states of the European Union, find out what is going on there and also show that there is something going on there. The situation is different in the European Union for legal and cultural reasons, but this by no means uh, means that ADM does not exist, quite the contrary. And this is what we set out to prove with our report. So, how did we do that? Um, the EU is very diverse, and <laughs> I think everyone agrees with that statement in this room. But this, of course, poses a problem if you, do, um, if you set out to do a research effort like this one, because the, uh, compiling these examples from all the different member states requires the knowledge of local language, structures, and culture. If you don't speak Slovenian, you will not find half of what is going on in Slovenia if you're trying to do that research from the outside. And this, is, of course, is true for all the other countries that we covered. So it was very important for us to do this in this network um, fashion that Brigitte already alluded to. Um, but it, of course, also requires expertise on the topic of research, which is also in its infancy. And I'll tell you how we uh, managed that, how we uh, found a way to find experts experts in this field who are also um, very much grounded in their, in their countries and the, and the cultures. So what the uh, report does, it serves two different purposes. First of all, to present the state of ADM in the EU. I mean, this is what you are holding in your hands, the report itself, but also to build a network of experts, which is more virtual, of course, but very real in the sense that you need these networks to be able to, on a continuous basis, find out what is going on. So what is this network? The network is a network of 15 researchers from 12 countries. And of course, we are still working, I mean, continuously on um, expanding that network. But for this report, it was 15 different researchers from 12 countries. The um, countries are depicted here on the map. And um, they are from academia, they are journalists, they are civil society members. Why is that? For different reasons. First of all, as I said, we needed to find people with expertise in these fields. And we weren't able to choose either group, either stakeholder group, because then we would not have managed to find people qualified to do this in all these countries. But on the other hand, we as a civil society organization don't have a problem with that at all. On the contrary, we see this as a, a feature that we have different uh, um, or people from different professions and people from different backgrounds in this group. And the background is also very diverse. I mean, the, um, the uh, qualification background. We have people from media studies, journalism, law, cultural studies, international relations, sociology, philosoph philosophy, data journalism, and political studies. All of these made up the network of people who contributed to the report. And I can tell you that um, it, it made, I, at least that's my opinion, it made it um, 
um, uh, better than if we only had one uh, had had one group of them. Okay, now turning to the results, because I suppose that's what everyone is uh, looking for. Um, we decided to have four categories that we uh, structured the report around, and these categories are how is society discussing automated decision making. So um, you know there are legislators who are discussing this, there are um, commissions discussing this, and civil society actors and journalists and so on and so forth. So we found examples of the discussions that are going on in the different countries. Um, and I mean, it's probably necessary to say, although to us it's quite uh, natural, um, this report that we did, I mean, we ended up with 150 pages. We started out thinking about 80. We ended up with 150 pages. Of course, it can't be all encompassing. It's a, it's a selection of examples that we collected, and it needs to be clear, because if you think about uh, doing a um, you know, concise research in 12 different countries, we probably would have uh, produced 1,000 pages, but it also would have taken a couple of years to uh, finish that. So how is society discussing automated decision making? What regular proposals exist already? Um, hard to uh, find and um, hard to decide which are the ones that are actually geared towards uh, automated decision making because they usually don't have the word uh, in it. What oversight institutions and mechanisms are in place? And uh, what ADM systems are already in use? I suppose from the reactions that we got so far, I mean, we shared this report with a selected uh, group of, of people to get feedback. Uh, this is one part that is very interesting to many because they see, ah, this is where it happens, you know, this is where the, the systems are really uh, deployed in, in, in practice. But we think that all the other categories are as important because it's important to, need, to, to understand how the whole thing is situated in the, in the society and in the political discussions. Now, let's turn to these examples. What we found out is that priorities differ enormously from country to country. So, for example, um, research funding. In Spain, uh, which has a GDP of uh, 1,400 billion U US dollars, we have a program um, of 4 million euros via the Activa Industria uh, 4.0 program to support 400 companies to advance their digital transformation and improve their competitiveness by adopting new enabling technologies, right? Um, and we tried hard to find other government programs. Of course, you can't usually or you can't always decide, ah, this money goes into research on automated decision-making, but uh, this, is, this is what we found. In Sweden, on the other hand, a much smaller country size-wise and economically, uh, just uh, it, there, there was one uh, private foundation, the uh, Wallenberg Foundation, that um, pledged 100 million euros to two universities to develop machine learning AI and the mathematical apparatus behind it. Uh, of course, we all know these numbers of uh, German government uh, says they invest 3 billion euros in the next couple of years and the EU is investing billions of euros. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's just that, as I said, we were collecting examples to show how different the approaches are. When it comes to political debates, um, in some countries, like in Germany and the United Kingdom, we have, in addition to a number of government and parliamentary commissions, the data protection authorities, the business associations and NGOs, who are looking into the consequences of automated decision making and what is going on. And then in other countries, like Poland, Slovenia or Italy, our researchers told us that automated decision making systems are used in practice, but almost invisible in the political debate, right? So uh, this is the policy gap also that uh, Ralf referred to uh, in his introductory statement. And then we looked at legislation and oversight. and. Um, in France, for example, there is a law already, and it's not a new law, that mandates all branches of government to make their algorithms transparent, but no one complies, right? That's an interesting fact. And then in other countries, like in Finland, the non-discrimination ombudsman brought a case to a tribunal that banned a company from using a certain credit scoring model because the tribunal deemed it discriminatory, threatening a 100,000 euro fine for non-compliance, right? So you see that there is action in some countries, there is uh, uh, apparently good legislation in other countries, but um, no enforcement. So again, we have a, a wide variety of approaches here. And now um, I have one slide, I usually, as you saw, I, I usually um, don't um, 
uh, or tr I try not to uh, put too much content on one slide, but uh, I did with this one because I wanted to give you some very concrete and clear examples of automated decision making used in the public sector. And I see this as, a, as one main takeaway of this report, of doing this research. We have systems of automated decision making or support that are identifying children vulnerable to neglect in Denmark. We have systems that allocate treatment for patients in the public health system in Italy. We have systems that are detecting or trying, uh, helping to detect welfare fraud in the Netherlands. We have systems that allocate benefits to the unemployed in Poland. We have others detecting learning problems in primary and secondary schools, trying to help teachers to find problematic uh, um, students in Slovenia. We have systems assigning social benefits in Sweden, and we have predictive policing in many EU member states. Now, if you look at this list of examples, I think uh, there doesn't need to be much uh, more information about the question, or much more to be said about the question of how, uh, what impact do these systems have nowadays. Okay, last words about the recommendations. Of course, we try to distill recommendations out of the research that we did. Um, there's one thing that we are not happy with ourselves. I'm uh, very uh, honest and open about that. We would have liked to find um, concrete recommendations on the country level for each country, but time didn't allow for that. So we have general rec recommendations for the um, EU as an institution and also the member states. And these recommendations are, please focus the discussion on the politically relevant aspects. What does that mean? That means that no, we don't really need to discuss super intelligence and the question whether robots are going to enslave us pretty soon too much in politics and science because this is not what we should be concerned with. Consider automated decision-making systems as a whole, not just the technology. I already explained that uh, viewpoint, so I'm not going to repeat that. Empower citizens and public administrations to adapt, administration to adapt to these new challenges. So we need programs to tell people how this works and uh, make them empower them and make them able to make better decisions themselves, but also public administration. Uh, there's a lot going on in public uh, administration, and there's a lot going wrong in public administration, but that's most of the time, at least that's my feeling, not because these people are nefarious, it's because they need uh, better expertise and qualification. Make sure that adequate oversight bodies exist and are up to the task. That is a very, very important demand. We have, uh, I have showed you the example of uh, Finland where this already happened. We have an example in Germany that came out of our Open Schufa project there, where we can actually say that the oversight for uh, this specific, very, very um, dominant and powerful credit scoring company in Germany is completely inadequate, right? So there's, again, a, a wide span. Uh, involve a wide range of stakeholders in the development of criteria for good design processes and audits, uh, including civil liberty organizations. I did not say NGOs. I specifically said civil liberties organizations because there are a lot of organizations that consider themselves NGOs and they are fewer who say we are civil liberties organizations and we think that this is important to have them on board. And the last thing in, as a recommendation, and that is not in the report itself because you know we came up with that uh, later on, mandate the public sector to provide transparency about the use of ADM systems, specifically the public sector. This is not saying that we should not be looking at the private sector, but we feel that in the discussion right now there is too much focus on the private sector and too little focus on the public sector. So it's important for us to know where, how, what for these ADM systems are used and uh, who they are bought from, uh, who developed them, um, whether it was in-house or just bought by a third-party um, um, company. That's all. That was a tour de force to the um, results of the report, and now I'm really curious to hear what you have to say about this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. Now we have uh, three committed MEPs, and that really uh, makes us very happy. Let me introduce uh, Lisa Yakonsari. She represents the Finnish Social Democratic Party in the S&D group, and she is also a former Minister of Labour. She'll speak first. Julia Reda represents the German Pirate Party in the Green EFA group, 
and she focuses on the challenges of our information society. And then Michał Boni, uh, representing the Polish Civil Platform and the EPP Group. He's also a former Minister of Administration and Digitization. So we have good people here. Lisa, please. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Mr. Spielkamp, for this excellent uh, uh, report, because it's very well written. It's even exciting. That's very seldom in this house that you can get uh, exciting reports. That's, thank you very much. And what is important, this is uh, really the first overview of automated decision making within Europe, first. So I, I really hope that many will read this report. For us policymakers, the report gives good insights and recommendations. Uh, and it also raises questions that need to be considered quite soon. I highly appreciate the holistic approach of the report. And IDM systems are, are very complex that operate within our complex societal uh, environments. Uh, and um, uh, all this have direct or, or indirect human and societal impact, as you said earlier. Therefore, all elements need to be taken into account. The report rightly points out that the very first decision to de develop ADM system is decisive. What are the reasons behind the ADM system and what is its purpose? I'm sure that the worst word trust is key. However, I would like to argue that it must be an enlightened trust, which we first need to create. And uh, this is based on legality, accountability, ethics, transparency, and on the basis of understanding by the users. So another ongoing research algorithm decision making is our Algo Aware pilot projects, currently managed by the DG Connect. And uh, therefore, I'm very pleased to see Mr. Prabhat Agarwal taking part in our panel discussion. To me, the pilot project research and this uh, report by Algorithm in Watch complement each others. In fact, our citizens want to know more about algorithms. Uh, and uh, I have an experience of it because in a recent seminar I organized in Helsinki, the room was overfull. Therefore, I agree very much that educational programs for citizens, such as uh, uh, Finnish co online course on artificial intelligence, is a must. Our citizens need to and want to understand uh, the new technologies, and they need to be taken on board in the debate. The adoption of the uh, GPR the EU's data protection regulation, which currently the French Data Regulation Authority is testing, is a step in the right direction. However, your report rightly points out that the GDPR has shortcomings and does not solve all the challenges posed by IDM systems. My, questions, my question to the expert is what kind of governance tools could be put in place for ADM systems where GDPR does not apply. So awareness is growing among citizens, among the um, society at, at the whole, but, at, but ac accountability, for example, remains an uncertain factor. This is not very helpful for tr as, uh, trust. What is in interesting, you describe personality profiling of job applications by scanning their email accounts. My youngest assistant is uh, 23 years old. She immediately reacted that she never ever would hand, hand out her username or password to anyone, not even for getting a job. Her argument uh, uh, for a refusal was that uh, she would not know what to do in case of misuse. Who is accountable? 
How can I be sure that my email account information remains under my control, she argued. She would not have trust in the company. In fact, she said that even if a trusted third party would audit this procedure, she would be very hesitant to allow the scanning of emails. Uh, so that is an example how the trust is low even among the young citizens. In almost all papers and discussions, we repeat, we repeat the human-centric approach. That's right. Humans should remain in charge of the final decision-making. But how do we ensure this? Can we ensure human-centric systems? And are they then guarantee, a guarantee for transparency and, uh, and accountability? It is right that we have legal frameworks in place uh, and that automated decision-making does not operate in a deregulated environment. But what are the solutions? One of the recommendations of the report is the call for oversight. The report states that parliaments and courts need to oversee the use of IDM systems. However, there exists a significant gap between the call for governance and the defining of what exactly needs to be governed. Moreover, which would be the adequate tools and measures for such oversight? Do we need independent ADM auditing boards? And can, can algorithms save us from human error? This is the title of an article writ written by Dina Pokempner of Human Rights Watch. She claims that machine learning tools should always be under human control. They can be put to good purposes or to bad ones. This is the policy choice. Yes, I think it is. Finally, I was slightly amused uh, by your answer to the question, is ADM bad thing? You answered, it depends. <laughs> and you are right. Uh, we could ask, is an axe good or bad? It depends how to use it and by whom. You can kill with us a human being, but you can build a church. Um, in a, <coughs> we are really living interesting times, and we could learn something from the past, too. In the development of the medical profession, there came a moment in ancient Greece when one realized that those medical doctors can make your, you healthy, but also they can use their medical knowledge to make you sick. And they, therefore, they invented the oath of Hippocrates. That is still in use, that is still valid. And my, my, my question is, do we perhaps also need a code of conduct for ADM systems and developers? And I'm, I'm sure that we can think about it. And now it's time to thank you for your attention. And, and now I hand over the floor to my colleague, colleague Julia Reda. The floor is yours, Julia. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, I would uh, like to thank all of the speakers uh, for this very interesting and uh, quite timely report. I think uh, education about uh, artificial intelligence and automated decision making is certainly uh, very needed in the policy debates uh, that we are having because. Uh, we are discussing at this moment quite a lot of legislation that uh, could have an impact uh, on this area. And I think it's always very useful to know what is already in place inside the European Union. And uh, when I looked at the different examples that uh, the report 
um, comes up with, uh, it's quite clear that a lot of the automated decision making that happens in the public sector is aimed at the weakest parts of society. And I think that's uh, probably not a coincidence and something that we have to be very aware of. And it probably does not just happen in the public sector. Uh, one very uh, unusual and uh, somewhat funny side effect of being an MEP is that I have found uh, that I um, quite frequently get employed by friends of mine to have their social media accounts unblocked because uh, they find themselves in a situation where they cannot get through to a human being when a decision by uh, automation had, has been done wrongly. And uh, what helps in this situation is privilege. It's the ability to pick up a phone and have somebody answer the phone. But obviously, this is not a very um, uh, useful way of doing things. So I think, in a way, automation uh, can make decisions at scale a lot easier and can be useful for both sides of the equation. But it becomes a problem when, as the subject of an automated decision, you are not able to, to actually talk to a human being when uh, this, this decision-making process has made a mistake because uh, I think in these discussions when we talk about artificial intelligence we very often uh, forget that these systems are not intelligent they they can uh, identify patterns but they don't actually understand what they see so for example um, when there are these uh, experiments about uh, machine learning trying to create pictures of cats, uh, they suddenly start uh, showing fragments of garbled uh, uh, letters under the cat pictures because they don't understand that uh, the captions of memes are not actually something that makes a cat a cat. So uh, I think, uh, therefore, it's, it's very useful to, to look at this issue as a, as a problem of automation and where should we use it. Um, I think in the discussions at the European level, we are facing very contradicting attitudes because on the one hand, it's exactly this narrative of uh, uh, we're going to have the singularity that's either going to destroy civilization or our jobs, uh, depending on how extreme you want to take it. So there is a lot of fear uh, regarding the use of algorithms. But at the same time, there is also an almost childlike trust that algorithms can uh, take care of even the most complex uh, regulatory tasks that uh, even courts are grappling with on a daily uh, level. So we're seeing this um, certainly in the discussions around upload filters. We have the copyright proposal where uh, the public sector is asking the private sector to use algorithms to make decisions about legality. And we also now have the, the terrorism regulation, which is going in a similar direction. And uh, I think one very important uh, and interesting development that goes along with this is uh, that the laws or the norms that underlie what we're trying to make legal or illegal change based on what algorithms can do. So you see this in the copyright de debate that suddenly the question of whether something is an original work or not doesn't matter anymore because it, an algorithm cannot tell the difference between uh, human invention, originality or not. They just look at is it the same work, yes or no. And uh, the same way in terrorism, the uh, idea that intention plays a role goes away because an algorithm cannot detect it. And so that's why I think it's very important and uh, it's very welcome that your report is uh, taking an interdisciplinary approach because you would not be able to, to discuss and to anticipate these kinds of problems if you only look at automated decision making from an engineering point of view. And uh, finally, I would also like to very much um, welcome the recommendation about transparency because we see that sometimes a lack of uh, accountability and transparency is uh, abused in order to use automated decision making to cheat. I mean, there may be examples in the uh, public sector, but certainly the, the most uh, relevant one that we have seen in our work in the European Parliament is Dieselgate, where companies uh, have been able to make use of the fact 
that uh, the decision-making systems inside cars are completely opaque in order to circumvent the regulatory instruments that have been in place to try to enforce environmental norms. So I think more transparency uh, in, in many cases making software uh, available for public scrutiny or at the very least to the authorities that have to um, uh, oversee them is extremely important and uh, should be part of the policy debate we're having. Thank you. Thank you, Julia Reda. And now over to Michael Boni. First of all, thank you very much uh, uh, to all organizers, initiators, and authors of the report. It is a great job, uh, very useful, very inspiring, and very needed. And thank you very much to my colleagues, because I think uh, it's also very important to understand those issues in the uh, 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 broad uh, frame and, on the other hand, to join some uh, practical debates when uh, uh, we are making now in the European Parliament with a debate, public debate, on algorithms and uh, the automated decision-making. What is the special added value of, uh, of this report? The aware choice to use the term automated decision-making systems instead of artificial intelligence. It defines more accurately what we are facing to as societies. And this is a way to put the separation between artificial intelligence schemes and uh, IDM, but on the other hand, to find many interdependencies and connections. So this, is, this is the way to have much more broader picture of those uh, phenomena. The real effort and proposal to establish, it was mentioned uh, in the uh, uh, presentation, the foundation uh, for the European IDM reporting network. Uh, this network will connect European journalists, experts, representatives of civil society, civil liberty organizations interested in the field and assist them in developing their skills and expertise on IDM. Very strong message that we need to have the collaborative model to create the real partnership of all stakeholders with involvement of all kinds of businesses, civic society, public institutions, academia. This is the only way to build the social and political background for the most adequate solutions regarding the oversight institutions. The clear conviction that uh, uh, automated decision-making requires social and human control, and it should be democratically controlled by the combination, as it is expressed in the report, of regula regulatory tools, oversight mechanisms, and technology. This is the background for the trust you have expressed is very, very strongly. The strong view and position that using, uh, art uh, that using IDM systems is not a bad thing, but it depends on conditions, purposes, and transparency, and that there are not only risks and threats, but also opportunities. The clear understanding that algorithmically controlled automated decision making systems should be treated as a whole, not just uh, uh, as a technology, it's uh, clear and it's very important to understand. Raising the problem of the decision to apply IDM in itself for a certain purpose, the way it is developed, for example, by a public sector entity or a commercial company, and how it is procured and finally deployed. Also important is the question whether IDM has a problematic bias. Very strong emphasis that empowering the citizens to adapt to new challenges is crucial, uh, and making clear how important it is to help the public administration to adapt to new challenges. Public administrations use IGM for purposes that have a big impact on individuals and society, for example, border uh, control, crime prevention, and welfare management. They must ensure a high level of expertise inside its own institutions in order to either develop systems themselves or be able to oversee outsourced development. Expertise should be available at the EU level uh, to assist member states. 
clear view that data protection framework is not the full answer. Article 22 of the GDPR has limited reach, uh, and we need to remember that there are some areas which are out of the scope of GDPR, so we need to discuss how to protect privacy, how to protect personal data, how to protect our choices and individuals also in the light of fundamental rights, and not only uh, thinking and considering that GDPR will solve uh, uh, all problems. Strong and clear conviction that we need to use uh, the European perspective when we are talking about IDM problems, risks and, and opportunities and exchange of information, exchange of uh, best practices is one of the key uh, issues. At the end, I want to express three points. Firstly, in the EU and beyond, we have to work on the education and building the awareness about the artificial intelligence and the use of automated decision-making systems. The perception of the importance of data protection and the protection of the rights of individuals in the digital sphere is very different and stronger than a few years ago. Uh, secondly, we have to acknowledge that companies start to understand this and there is a trend to self-regulate and work towards building trust in their services through such practices. It leads us to the consideration how crucial is proper framework for IDM development, which means not only strong and tough regula regulations, but the soft law solutions, code of conduct, self- and co-regulation schemes, and proper technical standards. It would be inspiring, the third point, to use the achievements from the Fundamental Rights Agency report on artificial intelligence, big data, discrimination in data-supported decision-making, which has highlighted steps to follow to work towards algorithms being fair and non-discriminatory, checking the quality of the data being used to build algorithms to avoid faulty algorithm training, promoting transparency, being open about the data and code used to build the algorithm, as well as the logic underlying the algorithm, and providing meaningful explanations of how it is being used, carrying out impact assessments that focus on the implications for fundamental rights, including whether, the, whether they may discriminate based on protected grounds and seeing how proxy information can produce biased results, involving experts in oversight to be effective, effective reviews need to involve statisticians, lawyers, social scientists, computer scientists, mathematicians and experts in the subject at issue. It's the future, but I think that we are starting now. And that at the very end of my remarks, I want to thank especially to Alek Tarkowski, who prepared the Polish part of the report. It is uh, very well designed and with clear recommendation. We need stronger public debate on those issues regarding the functioning of the IGM systems and also artificial intelligence, because it's not only the technology. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all three of you. Uh, I'm happy that we sort of planned this discussion firmly in the European Parliament because this is hopefully a starting point to, to continue the work. Now, uh, I'll rush through the program uh, as one has to do in the, in the role of moderator. Thank you very much. We'll have a change here and get some experts up and the uh, uh, MEPs uh, to the seats below. And there's... Um, yeah. We have uh, Minna Ruckenstein. She is a professor at the Consumer Society Research Center and the Helsinki Center for Digital Humanities at the University of Helsinki. Uh, Christina? And please welcome Ursula Pachel. She is the Deputy Director General at the at BEOC, uh, the consumer representation at European level. 
and she is a member of the EU high-level expert group on artificial intelligence. And then we have Prabhat Agarwal. He is a deputy <laughs> head of the e-commerce and online platform unit at the Directorate General for Communication, Networks, Content and Technology at the European Commission. And of course we have Matthias Spielkamp here from Algorithm Watch. Um, so we have great expertise on the panel to answer the trickiest question of all that was mentioned in the report. Uh, is automa automation a bad thing? And the answer is, it depends. So throughout this, this discussion, I would really like to focus on the how. So how can we achieve this delicate balance what is needed in terms of information, and I really like this word, uh, the, the informed trust, uh, the research, what is needed in terms of education, regulation, and public engagement. So, um, Minar, if we can start with you, you pointed at several problematic or potentially problematic cases of ADM in Finland, the one on discrimination in, in, credit, in the credit scoring scheme, for example, and others. Um, if we want to use ADM in the service of citizens and society, so, so how can we make sure to get the right distinction between the good and the bad use? And there is a slide. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so thank you. So, uh, as, a, as a background, I would like to say that um, I'm a researcher, but I have been participating in this journalistic report because I think it's so important that we have cases that we can do research on. So the uh, credit scoring case that we describe in the report has, um, has some beginnings of you know, what you could really dig into because basically um, a company is banned for using statistical scoring method. It's quite remarkable. But it's not the end of the discussion because, uh, because it's, it hasn't been in administrative court, so it's a tribunal d decision which, you know, which basically says that it's remarkable that a guy who wanted to have a, a loan was not granted the loan, but if this Finnish uh, man in his, in his 30s, if he would have been a woman or if he would have been a Swedish-speaking Finn, he would have been granted the loan. So basically we have a case of uh, uh, multiple discrimination, but it still is debatable how do we actually, what kind of a stance we take in terms of this decision. So, uh, so we can say that yes, um, bad automation is discriminatory. But then when I've been talking about this, this case, many people say that, well, haven't we always had that? When, uh, when people are uh, applying for kindergarten places, some people get better than others. Uh, when, uh, when we apply for social benefits, they don't always go the right way. But what I've, what I've argued is that there is a <coughs> sort of qualitative shift that we need to start thinking about because uh, if there was discrimination before, it's not a reason to say that, you know, let's just have some more of it. So, um, so from my research perspective, there's one slide I would like to um, show you. Uh, this is uh, based on uh, <coughs> Tamar Sharon's recent work, and she has actually been looking at the health field and what is happening in terms of health data uses. And what she's saying is that when we think about the good and the bad, we actually have many different kinds of goods. And in terms of starting to think about how do we actually um, decide what is common good in terms of automation, we should be able to distinguish between different kinds of aims. So what the aims here are, uh, civic aim is, is very important for all as speakers, I would imagine. You know, we, we want to be part of the developments of uh, ADM not becoming discriminatory, so we think that it's important to maintain equality, solidarity, collective well-being in terms of uh, automated decision-making. But then we have other aims that are very strongly present when automated decision-making systems are developed. 
We have market claims, economic growth. We want competition. We want, computer, uh, we want con consumer choice. Um, and that's part of this scene as well. Then we have uh, the engineers who are saying that we are not pro-market, but we want to use ADM systems because we need efficiency. And this efficiency might be uh, in hospitals. We want to uh, make sure that all the beds are used uh, and people are flowing in the right way, or we might, might want to see efficiency in terms of recruitment of people. So, uh, so it's a kind of industrial logic that we, we, we think it's a good thing. But if that industrial logic starts to compete with the equality thing, then we have a trade-off. Which one of these do we, uh, do we want to endorse? Then one logic that is very, very prominent in this field is uh, innovation. I've been part of many projects that, uh, that pursue innovation in this uh, field. And when it comes to innovation, we let the in innovators to be very sloppy when it comes to, uh, to the aims. So they just say, yeah, collective well-being for all, and it's kind of bought. And this is something that I would really like to see change. I would really like to understand that innovation, for instance, it doesn't produce a market immediately. If it promises to do that, it's not innovative. It's creating new kinds of markets. You have to think carefully, what are the business models here? It takes years. So, so we talk about automatic decision making in the innovation framework too lightheartedly. Then in the health field that Tamar Sharon discusses, uh, a kind of common thing is that we want more health. We want a better life. We want vitality. And this is, again, one of those sloppy things that you know, everybody thinks, of course, we want good life with automation. But then when you actually say, nobody's saying we want bad, bad life with automation. Nobody says in Silicon Valley that we want to make the, make the world the worst place. They all say we want to make the, the world a better place. So in terms of, uh, terms of these, I think that when we think about the good and bad, it's, it's really important to kind of, kind of uh, slow down a little bit and think that how could we actually work with these aims in a way that um, allows us to see better what we are aiming at. Because now we talk a lot about transparency in terms of the, the technical systems. But I think that the citizen, for the citizens, knowing what this kind of automation is actually doing and aiming to do is, is equally important. So um, bad automation could also be automation that promises optimization but doesn't optimize. Bad automation might also be uh, optimization, uh, um, um, automatic decision making that promises to be innovative, but it's, it's more of the same old. And one of the things that is very remarkable in the report is that we classify and we score. Can't we do anything else with the automatic decision making than classify and score? That's very low level machine learning. So, so you know, try to do something, something better. So in a, in a way, what I would like to see is that when, when research and practical efforts around ADM are developed using public resources, these aims should be clearly spelled out. What are the common good proposals and how are they seen through that it actually happens? And then from the kind of the regulator perspective, the question is that there is, there's a lot of stuff that can be done through self-regulation. So what can be done through self-regulation and what is the regulation that we need? Uh, legal regulation and understanding that these different aims actually might require quite different regulatory approaches. Thanks a lot, Mina. Uh, this logically almost leads further to Ursula um, because you're a lawyer by profession, you represent the European consumers and the, the question of what should be regulated, what should be the criteria, would be an obvious question also to you. What are the demands from consumers, from citizens, and how should regulation be addressed? Over to Ursula. Yes, thank you very much. 
Um, well, first of all, let me say I really enjoy being here today. This is a fantastic report. I haven't been able to read it in detail, but what I've seen so far in the recommendations in particular, I like them very much. Uh, it's very important to have these reports, and I'm a member of this high-level group. I'm sure that the high-level group will be very interested uh, to take uh, also the recommendations into consideration. So congratulations for that, first of all. Um, this question of uh, regulation and what is the role of regulation in this um, in these very important developments I think it's a it's a fundamental question I'd like to come back to this maybe at the end because I think what really disturbs us uh, uh, in this discussion currently at the European level is that there is so much focus on ethics uh, and ethics I have to say I've been in consumer uh, policy and law since 20 years but I have not really dealt with ethics so far and the question is why do we now focus on ethics why do we not focus on the existing legislations that we have already in place to protect people to protect consumers to empower people uh, and how this relates to uh, a market or a society or uh, public services that are dominated um, by automated decision making. So this is for us the fundamental question and unfortunately there is not so much attention given to it and with this high level group the deliverables as you know maybe are first of all ethics guidance where there has been a consultation uh, about that and then we will have um, policy and investment recommendations as a second deliverable and there we should also have a chapter on, on regulation. But just to say I think the first question that we also <coughs> would have to ask ourselves is why do we talk about ethics so much? Why do we not talk about the existing legal framework the legislative objectives that we have in that framework and how this would apply and how these objectives would still be met or not uh, by uh, a develop development uh, uh, led by automatic decision making. So this is um, one aspect that I think is highly important. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. But maybe just to give you also on this high level uh, the example of consumers and the situation of consumers, right? So what I really liked in the recommendations of, of the report is this question or this recommendation that you shouldn't consider ADM um, as a technology only but really look at the overall system and I would add to that and look at the overall societal impact. I think this is fundamentally important. If I give you the example of consumer, uh, the consumer situation, what we expect, what we see already is the functioning of the market will change considerably due to this automation and due to this um, automation which is based on more and more data collection from consumers and then the analysis and then the targeting, the profiling of consumers. So to put it in a very broad sense, now you go into a shop, you go on the internet to buy something. In the future, I think it will be the other way around. The businesses will come to you. If Alexa hears that you're coughing at home, they will, uh, she will tell you or it will tell you that you should do this and that and it will order something for you or medication or something on the internet. So there is a high degree of risk of losing autonomy, losing self-determination, um, losing the ability to choose because you don't know what Alexa is going to, I, I say Alexa, you could take uh, something else. So what I'm saying is the principles that we have in consumer law and the whole relationship that is trying to balance the powers between businesses and consumers, there is a big question mark in these markets that we will see very soon, we already see parts of it, that will be dominated um, uh, by, by, by machine behavior that we have to look at. So how to ensure fairness in these markets? We have fairness as a principle in, in consumer law, so it's not allowed to do unfair commercial practices. It's not allowed to have unfair contract terms. Uh, competition law is very much based on the principle of fairness. But how do you apply the principle of fairness in a black box market? How does that function? What do consumers need to protect themselves? What do authorities need to protect consumers? How do we ensure sufficient oversight? How do we ensure that our laws function in that context? So for me, this is not an ethical question. 
And this is how, sorry to say, the, the mandate of, of, of the high-level group has been defined. It has been given to the, um, uh, to the high-level group from the Commission as looking at fairness as an ethical principle. It's not an ethical principle, first of all. It's a legal principle, and we need to make sure that businesses comply to the law. Uh, and ethics is for us a second step, a complementary addition, which is very well justified in certain areas, particularly in the health area, for example. But what we have not discussed yet is what is the role of ethics and what is the role of the law? And do our laws still manage to do what they are supposed to do? And does our enforcement system still um, deliver to, to people in this type of environment? So for us, these are fundamental questions. Uh, and we are getting into this question of self-regulation. I've heard it a lot. Ethic guidance is nothing, of course, but self-regulation. It's, in this case, uh, guidance from a high-level group, uh, not even enshrined by the European Commission. Uh, so it's a few experts that have then decided with some input from not the public, but only those who are uh, on this AI Alliance platform. So it's a very limited thing. Uh, it is private uh, decision making. It is not democratic decision making by lawmakers, and we think that it should be the lawmakers who will frame our society in the future in, in a situation where automated decision making will be very common, probably. So, to, to maybe uh, just um, say very basically, we are, as, as consumer organizations, convinced that there will be a need for specific rights and specific remedies in that context. It's, I think, a bit too early to say exactly how and what, but just to say that information about do you deal with a machine or do you deal with a human being should be a very clear thing that we need. Uh, we should um, talk about transparency, explainability. We have the GDPR, but as already the report's very uh, clearly explains this is probably um, a very limited uh, protection that we will have from the respective articles in the GDPR and we will have to go beyond that. There is also questions about price discrimination. We have now uh, first level discrimination, anti-discrimination law in the European treaties and in secondary legislation. But if it comes to the question, do poor people maybe have to pay more? because they fall into a specific cluster and have been categorized, or et cetera, et cetera. That's economic discrimination where we don't have clear legal guidance on that. But you know that consumer law and policy started at the very beginning with the question and the, the aspiration that poor, should not, poor people should not pay more. And now, 50 years after, I think we're at exactly the same question. How do we frame this? I'm, not, I'm going over time, I think. How, do I have still one minute? Okay, so the last point is maybe about public funding. I think it's fundamentally important uh, what, what you said, Mina, and we fully support an approach, and we think we have to be very carefully look also at the European Union uh, funds, public funded research. It should be innovation that is really socially valuable. We should not fund innovation for the sake of innovation. We really have to make sure that there is a social benefit from it. Uh, and I think this is something which has been much more considered. And we need to fund uh, projects, instrument, tools that help consumers to defend themselves, help consumers to use their rights. And also, if I may, last point, help consumer organizations who do independent, independent testing of products and services to inform consumers, help them to be able to do their job also in the future when there is a very difficult uh, kind of um, question about transparency and access and accountability. Thank you very much. Sorry for... It's a... Thank you for interesting presentations. It's, a, it's a not pleasant to be a moderator when there are such exciting topics on the and experts on the panel. Uh, the, there were quite a few references to uh, regulation, and if I may hand the word to you, Prabhat, but still with the, with the balance between the need for regulation and the, the overall question, is it good or is it bad? Prabhat. <coughs> Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, it's also for me a real pleasure to be here. And of course, uh, um, you know, I get the really difficult question at the end. Uh, so uh, um, now let me actually not answer your question uh, and speak about something else uh, um, first. And so um, I work in the European Commission and I'm 
one of the people who has a, a scientific and engineering background, and I've worked also um, in the innovation part of the of the house. So um, I come to this actually with a with a kind of mixed background of both being a regulator and a scientist. And and when I speak about this issue, I can both parts of my brain are speaking kind of at the same time, and they're trying to compete with each other. You know. So um, what I wanted to say is. Um, that, uh, yeah, I think I, I really like your report very much, too, and I think uh, you've struck a, a, a balance and a nuance that, that I think is really, uh, you know, commendable and, and well done for that. And I think that it is exactly that kind of nuance that is uh, very important, I think, that, um, that will take us uh, forward, because I think that the, the two traps that I see um, that we should avoid is... Um, one, a kind of knee-jerk reaction, you know, a kind of panic moment where we have to say, oh my God, the algorithms are coming. And I, I think in the parliament, I've given this example before from a, uh, a, an internal meeting once where uh, I was confronted, I won't say even the affiliation or the, of the institution, but it is a true story where somebody asked me, um, can we not have the version without algorithm of this, please? You know, and um, so it's a little bit, uh, you know, there are, there are, there are a lot of mis misconceptions around it. So the one trap that we should avoid falling into is, uh, is the kind of knee-jerk reaction. I think the other extreme is also something that we should avoid and say, well, you know, this is let, let the market fix this and, and you know, we will we'll come, you know, anyway, we are too slow and, and, and not educated enough and we'll come back in 10 years and see what happens, you know. I think that's also, um, that's also not right. And, you know, and the, and the difficulty is, of course, to, um, to find the middle ground. And I think that your report uh, is really a valuable con contribution in, in the kind of degree of nuance. And particularly, I think um, your question, it depends. You know, of course, um, it's like uh, what, what, what Lisa said earlier, you know, it's, uh, many, there are many facets to it. There are good things that come from it, and there'll, there'll be challenges that we need to address um, with an open mind. Now, um, just, uh, it was mentioned already, we have been um, working on a mandate from the European Parliament uh, on a pilot project which is very similar to the report that you're doing. So, uh, and I, I, as, as also um, Lisa said earlier, that I think it is very much complementary to, uh, to what you're doing. So I think what we are getting now in, for the European Union is a kind of uh, a map, a map of the land, landscape um, that we have to navigate. And I think we see uh, on this map uh, the, the challenges and, and the difficulties, and, but also some opportunities that, uh, that we have. And I think that the clearer the map is, um, the, the more solid our orientation will, will be. And so that's, that's very welcome. And, and um, just for the people in the room is that our own report is available at the moment on, um, on, on, on the web, at the website Algo Aware, and it's open for commenting, so it's a little bit behind your report. You beat us to it by a couple of days, you know, but, uh, but, but it's uh, also worth looking at. Um, and we'll be looking at, the, at all of the material available as we go further. Now, before I, I avoid answering the question that you asked, um, I, I just uh, want to uh, make two, two other comments I think that um, are worth making. One, I think, one thing that we should think about a bit more is that what is driving all this? I think in your report you do touch upon this, you know, but I think it's very important to kind of be clear-eyed about um, what is going on. And, and I think there are multiple drivers that are shaping the kind of algorithmic information sphere at the moment. And, and, and there are, um, some of them have been mentioned already, but it's just worth kind of inventorying them because I think that we see the symptoms, but it's kind of also good to see what's underneath, uh, underneath these uh, symptoms. And I think my quick, re this is my quick personal take, is that in the public sector particularly, there is a reduction of resources available. You know, people have um, less money available, and, and, and it's something that we all uh, expect is that, the, that we should be doing more with less, you know, and, and, and one way of answering that doing more with less uh, um, is, is, to, uh, is to turn to automation, you know, in, in particularly in the public sector. You know, I think that is a very important driver, you know, and so I think in our framing of responses, I think um, it's sometimes not really, I think, um, credible to, to look for alternatives, you know, like um, the alternatives that are, um, th that are not taking care of these drivers, you know. So all of our alternatives, all of our options, 
will still have the public sector financial pressure and the human resource pressure on top of them. You know, so um, sometimes uh, I think credit scoring is done because it is seen as an efficient automated credit scoring is done because it's seen as being more efficient in the first place, not necessarily um, being more unfair or more problematic. You know, that's that's an important driver, and I think that that exists also in the private sector, but it is particularly interesting in the public sector. I think that the, the, the other drivers are, of course, the increased availability of the technology and also of data sets. You know, I think that this is um, that is actually enabling some kind of decision to be uh, um, to be taken. I think that's another. Um, in in some of the questions that are being discussed in this area, I think one thing is also important to bear in mind is a. Uh, an important driver that maybe we haven't discussed so much is the reduction of our attentional capacity. You know, we want to uh, um, access goods and services now from this whole sea of goods and services. You know, but we want to spend um, the least amount possible um, in finding the right goods and services. So, in a way, there is also, uh, I think, um, a, um, as speaking as a consumer, you know, a demand that I want to be served more more quickly with the most uh, um, relevant material. And, as a, and, and the answer to that frequently also lies in some form of automation or some form of, some, some form of uh, automation. I think these are, of course, not complete, but I just wanted to bring them into the discussion because I think that the answers that are being discussed and the recommendations, they also need to be tested against these drivers. You know, for example, when we speak about enhanced transparency, we all know the difficulties with terms and conditions and clicking through is that we don't read um, um, the material that's already there. So enhanced transparency, if it requires, if it's a burden on additional attention, I'm not sure it's going to work because, uh, you know, or unless we have some kind of third party um, that will that does the checking for us, you know, so some of the some of the stuff, if I need to read more terms and conditions just to understand um, that uh, I'm being exposed to an automated system, I, I'm, I'm not so sure, you know. So as we look for solutions, let's not only look at the problems, but let's look at also kind of the layer beneath it a little bit. Okay, now the question is, you know, what about regulation and, and you know, ethical principles are not enough and so on. I think, you know, first of all, speaking kind of just generally um, for the Commission, I think, you know, the we have an approach which says basically we have the right of initiative to propose regulation and legislation in an area where we have competence. You know, the, um, and I think we should use this and, and wisely. And the way, best way to use it is through our um, impact assessment and better regulation process. We should be very careful about understanding exactly what the problems are. And, and the reports that are on the table and are emerging, these are very good starting points. But I don't think personally that um, kind of... Um, this uh, means a black and white answer, should we regulate algorithms or not? It, it just says that where there is a real case to be made, we should definitely not shy away from it. But also it says somehow regulation is not necessarily always the best answer. You know, the, um, sometimes because we don't have the competence, sometimes because they are in, in, uh, ineffectiveness. I, I was very um, taken by your example from France about disclosure of algorithms which is not being enforced. So before creating new regulation, and I think this is something, let's, let's also make sure that we enforce existing um, rules that are, that are there. So I think that we do have a structured process in place, um, and with all its criticism, but at EU, EU level, we do have a structured process in place which doesn't really exist to the same degree in member states, I think. That takes us through a kind of intellectual exercise to make sure that we are adding value, that it is proportionate effective, and I think this is an important guiding light also, and it also applies to the area that, that we are um, looking at here. And sometimes the conclusion is, uh, also in areas that I've worked on, is that actually, um, you know, hard law isn't the best answer, you know, to, uh, to, to this, but sometimes it is. So I think that we should be, be open to um, working on the basis of specific issues, specific cases, um, and specific evidence that supports these cases and then make a case for it and then debate it, of course, within the democratic process. Now, um, this is the, um, just to kind of just to give you a flavor. This is the approach that we've been cho cho choosing in our uh, project um, where we are now going to kind of um, carry out a set of in-depth case studies, you know, on specific areas, you know, for example, consumer credit scoring. Uh, but also um, online filtering of content where we think that we, we need to do a lot, we need to dig, dig a lot deeper in terms of our knowledge. And also areas 
um, that are emerging of Im importance. For example, the ecosystem around online advertising. I think this is a very important algorithmic system, um, which we have not really looked at very carefully. And this is just giving you some examples of areas where I think that, uh, um, that we are going to take an approach which is really case by case, evidence based, and, and without, in, where if uh, at the end of our analysis we feel um, that there is a, a case to be made for regulation, we won't shy away, but at the same time, we will avoid a kind of overreacting into this. That's my short intervention. Thank you very much. <laughs> we hear the, the need for nuance and for very specific approach to which direction we want to go. Matthias, may I ask you to wrap up shortly because we're a little bit behind schedule. Yeah. Um, and then... I, I won't try a wrap up of what has been said because it was just said. So I think all of your memories are good enough to know. Um, the thing is that I was told that we are not going to be kicked out of this room at half past, so we can go five minutes over. But of course, we want to be an, as, as uh, punctual as possible because you have other commitments. So um, wh what I hear from the different comments is um, that um, we, um, we will have this debate about ethics and legislation for a while, you know, because uh, Ursula, you said you, are, um, you think that there is a, um, uh, not an adequate uh, focus here, and that is one position, but of course there, there are the other positions uh, who are arguing that uh, you can't do everything with law in uh, liberal societies, so there, this struggle will be ongoing, but I think it, it was a very fascinating um, uh, intervention you made, and, and you gave good examples of why you say that uh, uh, it can't be, we can't uh, keep it on this meta level. Actually, I totally agree. Um, we need these ethical guidelines, but we need to be much quicker to finally operationalize what that means in practice, you know. Yes, we all want to be good, and uh, even some, uh, some um, companies want to be good, but what does that mean, and what does it mean if, they, uh, if, if then they end up not being so? <laughs> So good, yeah. What's what society's answer to that? Um, I'll, I'll keep it at that because we would like to uh, take your questions. So if there are any, um, please go ahead immediately. There's a gentleman there. Um, thank you. So, hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm Nicolas Moes uh, from the Future Society. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this report. It's, uh, it's a very nice survey, and I'm uh, hoping to see it uh, launch a proper discussion about it. Um, as, the, as the Future Society is an is a independent NGO uh, itself advocating the good governance of AI, I'd be curious to have the, the panel's view uh, on uh, this last recommendation that you made about involving a wide range of stakeholders, including, and I particularly appreciate it, civil liberty organization. Uh, to in the design of governance. So how concretely would you see that happening? Uh, especially when we know in Brussels how things work, it's, it's actually, I would be really interested to see uh, more concretely it's, uh, your, your thoughts on, on how to make that happen, to, involve, to ensure that the NGOs are involved in the, in the discussion. Thank you. I just give the very brief answer to that, that as an NGO itself, of course, I mean, this is the way we try to um, uh, make our voices heard in, in this discussion, but and of course I know how hard it is. Um, and there, I think there is a lot to criticize on the member states level, um, a little on the European level as well, um, because when you look, for example, at the high-level expert group, uh, the way it is set up and the, the procedures in there, uh, it makes it very hard for uh, adequate um, uh, work uh, on a substantial basis uh, because of uh, short timelines and a very demanding uh, procedure. So that can be met more easily by, um, for example, people who are paid for doing these jobs than, uh, for example, civil society members or even academics, depending on their status. But I'd be very interested to hear other um, ideas on that here on the panel as well. I've been part of a so-called um, My Data movement for some years, and that's the Finnish initiative, which is really trying to bring stakeholders together to think about uh, governance models, new governance mod models around these, these issues. And, and it's, um, it's very difficult work because you have to actually um, think about 
how to come up with new infrastructures around these things. And sometimes, you know, they should be like temporary infrastructures to solve some issues. So, so if you're interested in that, you know, check what My Data Global is doing currently. Uh, just very briefly, so at the European level, I think the high level group is not a good example in terms of the balancing uh, of the different interests and the composition of that uh, group. I've been on the record since the very start. I was in the beginning the only consumer representative. We have very few civil society representatives and we have over half uh, our individual companies of, of the members. So we are 50, I don't know, 52. So there is a huge, of course, uh, majority of, of business interests represented. We have academics, but most of them are either technical backgrounds or ethical backgrounds, which I find very difficult. We don't have enough lawyers. We don't have uh, a data protection academic, for example. We don't have input from the health sector. Public health sector is not represented. So there is, I think, not really a model case to take away. I think it's very important for the member states to really look at that because I think the European Union in general is much better in involving stakeholders than at the member states level. And just maybe a, a kind of um, anticipation or spoiler, in the second deliverable of the high level group there will be different chapters and one will be on citizens engagement. I think that will be quite a nice chapter and there is another one on skills and education and I think that will also be very interesting. So there will be some good uh, recommendations in that respect I think from the high level group to say something positive about it. Thank you. And when can we then expect that? Well, there I have to look at the Commission because originally the timeline was, uh, I think, uh, May, but there are discussions because it's, it's difficult to meet these timelines and, and so we have to see. But uh, at least I think on these elements there, there is some good work going on to reassure everybody. I, I don't know the date either, so okay. it's, um, but I can find out. I, I, I just... Um, you know, I just want to defend the honor of the house a little bit here, you know, on my side. That I think that, uh, you know, of course, may, you know, maybe one group or the other group uh, doesn't meet the expectations of the in terms of diversity and inclusiveness and, and balance. Um, that, that, and, and I think we, sh we should be open, and I certainly will take back that feedback to uh, my colleagues. Um, you know, just, just I've been working in this area now for a, a while, and I just want to say that actually inside the Commission and inside our lawmaking processes, I think we've gone through an enormous change uh, over, over the last um, decade since I, since I started in terms of kind of balance and, and involvement of, uh, of, uh, of inclusive transparency also in terms of who is meeting whom and the transparency register and, and, um, and you know, a publication in our impact assessment of who has been spoken to, you know, we take very careful, um, we, you know, I don't want to bore you with our internal processes, but there, there are quite strict internal processes about whom you've met, when you've met them, and, and why you've met them. And there is a, there's also a kind of a, an, an attempt at professionalizing inside with using um, tools, also IT tools, you know, to help us get a better overview of whom we have not spoken to, you know, in our, in, in our, so this does exist and, and, um, and, you know, and it is being taken, a, I would just caution a little bit in taking one specific group and then just making a general statement about the whole, I think that there is a, a definite global desire on side of the institution, but certainly the commission to be um, very open, transparent, accessible, and also balanced, you know, and so we certainly try and I work on online platforms to make sure that I meet a balance of all stakeholders, not just industry, um, but also not just civil society and academics. So, so just to reassure you that, uh, that it, it, it's not, uh, it's not as, as terrible as it may sound. What would um, your recommendation be to a civil society group to make themselves heard? Well, I mean, I think that, so my view is that, um, okay, so they make themselves heard is, first of all, I think that in the particular issue, it needs, first needs to be issue specific, right? I mean, the, so they, you, want, you, you have an issue uh, and, you know, it's, uh, I think, easier today than when I started working for the commission where there was no name or telephone number of anybody available on the website. You know, this is when I started. I wanted to just ask someone, what job are you offering me? And I couldn't get an answer to this, you know, because I couldn't, uh, I couldn't speak to anybody. You know, today we are all... Uh, on, on the web, we are all on Twitter, we are all replying to all messages, uh, on, and it's relatively, I think it's much easier to find out who, who your partner is, and I, 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 you know, I, I believe that nobody refuses a contact 
uh, with a civil society um, organization unless there is a kind of a, you know, a, a serious reason for it. So I think that the first thing is to find, find out exactly like what Matthias said, is then who, who in your network is. Then I think that there are um, organizations that uh, group um, civil society interests together. They are very effective as, at making their voice heard, I think, uh, personally. Um, so grab so, the phone. Grab the phone and call the commission, but know what you're talking about. Thank you. May I summarize it like that? There was a lady over there and one question over there. First you. Please introduce, please introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Isabel Busca. I represent the German Consumer Organization here in Brussels. We've been working a lot on, on ADM. Thank you uh, for algorithm, to Algorithm Watch for presenting this really timely report. I think it's going to be a good basis to continue discussing this. Um, I've heard the message from the European Commission that you are pondering whether there is legislation needed. I don't want to make a point on whether legislation, yes or no, or any other tools. I'd rather like to hear from the Commission. I think Ursula made a good point to explain how non-discrimination and some other values that I would call something like ethics, already enshrined in the European treaties, right? If it's not values, how we conceive our societies and our, our rule of law, our states, um, what is it then? And the Commission's role is also to enforce it and uphold the treaties. So the main question for us, as we're looking from a consumer point of view on this, is how do we actually make sure that in today's ADM systems, our values are actually being enforced. And what is the Commission's thinking about that? Thank you. Commission. Yeah, thanks, uh, Isabel, for your question. Um, I think that, so uh, let me say, we, I think we agree, uh, I mean, you know, that this is an important area. You know, the, um, but I think I just want to say that, generally speaking, as you say yourself, non-discrimination is enshrined in the treaties. It's, a it's, a, it's part of the charter, something that uh, we probably need something more nuanced than just simply stating again that, um, that it is something generally applicable, because we probably need to look at specific areas where this uh, where a problem uh, emerges so i think that where um i mean i you know in consumer law i'm not the biggest expert on consumer law if there is if there is a, an area where there is known uh, deficiency in consumer uh, law with respect to discrimination i think where i'm very happy to facilitate a discussion with the relevant um, people on this i think that there are areas which are um, worth looking at not necessarily inside our competence so for example on labor law labor law where there's a huge potential for um, discrimination and, uh, and 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 through automatic decision tools i think that we are using the reports such as the one that has just been presented today and also the one that we have commissioned you know to look a little bit deeper and to see what kind of conversations we need to facilitate even in areas where we don't have treaty competences ne ne necessarily but to bring bring people together so i think my uh, answer to you is that we are taking it seriously uh, but the precise response depends a little bit on the, the specific area that we are taking um, you know i think that as i said earlier a mix of enforcement but also, um, you know, where needed, uh, and there is a clear regulatory gap within our competences, is definitely worth exploring. But uh, and on top, uh, in areas where we don't have treaty competences, I think we can coordinate and we can bring people together to say and, and to agree on principles. I think those are the those are the broad approaches. I think it's not fair to say that we are being less fair around uh, discrimination. I think this is a serious concern, and this is actually the reason why we have commissioned the reports as well that we've commissioned. So, where where? But again, I just wish to stress that it's. It's more useful um, in terms of approach, in my view, um, to move away from the generic and to go to the specific cases and to drill down how does discrimination appear really in HR decisions? How does it happen in labor market access? How does it happen in, in the gig economy? How, how does discrimination happen when you are buying stuff, you know, price discrimination and so on? You know? So uh, I am not an expert in all of these areas. But uh, this, this is, I think, a much more fruitful approach because we'll probably go further than simply uh, stating a generic treaty obligation. Okay. One last question, and then we'll have to conclude. Gentleman over there. Yes. Thanks. Um, my name is Wolfgang Kowalski from the European Trade Union Confederation. We welcome very much that you did this report, but we think, and there I can rejoin the remarks from the consumer organizations, 
that unfortunately the debate is somewhat biased. It's biased from the composition of the artificial intelligence group, but not only that. If you look, and there I, that's the only point I can uh, agree with the colleague from the Commission, fortunately we have more transparency now. If we look at the website Lobby Facts, who are the most important lobbyists seeing high, high level uh, commission civil servants. On top of the list you have Business Europe and on second place you have Google. And then you shouldn't be surprised that the debate, the content of the debate is biased as well. Because normally when you look at artificial intelligence you should ask the simple questions what are the challenges posed by artificial intelligence? How can we answer? What needs to be regulated and what can be left by, to ethics? But as the Commission is so influenced by the big IT giants, they only took the Silicon Valley approach, what can be done by ethical standards. And this is a wrong approach, I think. Uh, as has been said before, the Internet was for a long time a lawless zone. Then the European Union decided, thanks to the Commission initiative and thanks to some clear requests from the European Parliament and civil society, to adopt the first Internet law, the General Data Protection um, Regulation. But we need the next, the second, the third and fourth Internet law because in Internet a lot can be done without any supervision, without any control. And we think artificial intelligence is too important for the future that this can be left to ethical responses. Ethical responses can be complementary to regulation, but first we have to check what, for what do we need uh, legislation. And the colleague has quite rightly said, for discrimination it's not a value which can be let to left to ethical standards because ethical is not enforceable. It's self-regulation. So we leave it up to the people who design artificial intelligence to do what they want. They don't have to respect these ethics. Thanks. Thank you very much for that point, which uh, mirrors, if I understand it right, the point that was made by the consumers. Um, I have the real unfortunate task to conclude now. We are 10 minutes over time and we'll, we will have to leave the room. Uh, I see that this is very much the beginning of a, a discussion, or I hope that it's the beginning of a discussion that we will conduct over the years to come. Um, I would like to conclude it here. You will meet the people who, behind this report later today at the privacy camp and tomorrow at the privacy conference called CPDP here in Sharbek. Uh, so there will be much more discussion about this uh, in these days. Um, and we'll stay around here. So if you, if you want to talk with the editors uh, and the experts, we'll be in the house for a minute. Thank you all very much for coming.